Hello everybody, my name is Jimmy Smith and I am the owner of West London Wine School, Stretton Wine House and also South London Wine School and I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about geology and wine. Uh, so of course this is a um, fairly advanced section, this is uh, definitely aimed at those doing the latter stages of WSET. Um, so um, some students teaching level three may find this a bit too in-depth but it's definitely Sort of poised more towards level four but it is useful nonetheless if you are studying the uh, level three or level four i would definitely urge you to think about wine in these concepts and geology within wine is remarkably important so geology we'll be talking about of course soils we'll be talking about rocks uh, minerals and all those kind of things as mentioned, um, I'm Jimmy Smith, so I'm the uh, the founder and owner of West London Wine School based in London, Fulham, London in the United Kingdom. Also South London down in Greenwich and Streatham and also a wine bar called Streatham Wine House. Um, there we have a hashtag there that you can use. If you have any questions, please get in touch with any of these social media accounts. That's Twitter, Instagram, and you can use the hashtag. Also, our websites are there, West London Wine School, South London Wine School, and the Wine Bar at Streatham Wine House. So let's crack on then with a little bit of geology, one of my favorite topics. I think that it is absolutely fundamental in uh, actually crafting um, wines and uh, impacting the styles of wine. So we'll talk about that uh, a little bit. So it is important to begin with exactly what geology means and then the different sort of uh, for want of a better pun, the different strata within geology, the different sort of classifications and terminologies. So geology is the study of uh, and structure of the materials of the earth and also the processes that are acting upon them. So we'll be talking about, um, of course, rocks, minerals and soils, uh, but then also the, the kind of processes. So these could be plate activity, uh, erosion, uh, and uh, metamorphism and, and so on and how that can uh, of course create different types of, uh, of soils. Um, now linking it into wine, geology, uh, you know, it, it's often actually, geolo the word geology is not actually used that common. We often talk about just soils or, or we talk about, uh, I mean, and loosely soils as well. And then we talk about um, things like terroir. So grape growing, this is commonly referred to as terroir. Now I've put an asterisk here because this is a bit, big misconception. Um, so often if you hear people talking about wine, they will say, oh, could you tell me what the terroir is of this wine, please? And the person will go, oh, it's on chalk or it's limestone. It's not as easy as that. We are simplifying it to mean a, a certain substance. But in fact, um, terroir is a lot more complex than that. And I will come back to the definition, uh, the best definition we can give of terroir at the end of this presentation. So you may hear people talk about terroir. It is one single word in French and the French immediately get it. Whereas in English, it is like an essay. So we have to uh, really sort of talk about it and discuss all the key components. So first of all, we often talk about uh, the soil and what is the soil of the wine? How does the soil impact this wine and so on? But it's not as easy as that. The soil is only a specific part of this. So let's talk through three main areas really of geology and of wine. So first of all, all minerals, which uh, make up a lot of rock formation. So minerals such as things like uh, iron and quartz and uh, mica, uh, feldspar, um, quite a few different minerals. These minerals are important uh, as they um, can do a number of factors such as, uh, you know, different types of um, uh, heat retentions and uh, light refraction uh, and uh, have different types of um, capabilities and so on. So minerals are first up, uh, so they are often found within our rocks. Our rocks are the next part. Uh, so rocks um, are the normally things like you know, we say sort of bedrock, but also big, big boulders and rocks. Uh, these are formed by uh, strong masses of minerals. So these are things like um, uh, igneous based, sedimentary and metamorphic, our three major groupings of rocks. And we're going to go through those in, uh, in, great, uh, in great detail. 
And then finally, soils. So something that we talk very much uh, about in wine when we are talking about uh, how it impacts the wine, but we really do need to talk about all three of these. But soils, uh, now soil uh, would be the top layer of the earth's crust that's capable of supporting plant life and it uh, includes things like um, weathered rocks. Um, it will have, of course, all those minerals within them uh, and nutrients. Uh, it will have the humus uh, as well. So the organic matter, um, the rotted, decaying uh, organic matter, which thankfully is not absorbed by the plant in its flavors and aromas, because that would create very difficult uh, wines as a result but also things like stones as well found in those top uh, that top area. So that is the definition of our soils. Now, the three groupings of rocks. Um, so we uh, will talk about the different mineral contents found within these as we go through some examples, but really we're gonna talk about the three major groupings. And, and the first one is igneous rocks. Now this comes from uh, um, the Latin uh, and this igni, which means ig ignite, um, to set fire to. And that gives you an idea immediately of what this is. Uh, so basically igneous rocks are formed by, by, by heat, but, 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 but by things like molten rocks, molten magma from beneath the earth. So these are our igneous based, uh, based rocks. And I've got some examples and I'll show you some uh, in a second. So igneous rocks don't have to necessarily just be below ground. Um, they can also be out of ground as well uh, with things like ash, lapilli, uh, and so on. So igneous rocks. Um, the biggest category really is sedimentary rocks. Uh, so where igneous is formed uh, really below, below the ground from molten magma, sedimentary comes from sedimentation. That is the deposits of uh, lots of different things, but uh, mainly sort of um, animal life from seas and oceans. And I mentioned it's one of the biggest. It is because the world is 70% odd water. So therefore there is a hell of a lot of sedimentation from that water from the dead marine life, which causes all of these layers and strata of sedimentary soils, things like clays, uh, things like marls and mudstones and loaves and uh, chalks and limestones and so on. Um, so a very, very common soil to talk about, uh, a very, very sorry, common rock to talk about across, uh, across viticulture. And our third group, which is less common, is metamorphic. Uh, and metamorphic is something which is quite hard to grasp because where, as we can see igneous rock, if a volcano explodes, and we can see sedimentary because we can see layers upon layers. Metamorphic is all underground and it's all happening under temperature and pressure. And we don't know it's really happening to the eye, but we do once that rock has become weathered uh, and you'll actually see it as, a, as like a weathered mountain, for example. So these can be both a volcanic, uh, sorry, igneous um, uh, um, starting point or sedimentary. So either the origin is igneous or sedimentary. Uh, so we will uh, talk through some uh, major types of those. So they're your three major groups. We then we'll go into a bit more detail. So igneous, first of all, then, as I mentioned, formed from molten magma. So this is uh, underneath the ground um, in its uh, kind of liquid state. And as it is pushed up towards the crust of the earth, uh, it will probably solidify, not always, but uh, it can solidify and form um, uh, intrusive igneous rocks in the ground. But some of it will escape, and that will escape as lava flows or as uh, pyrocrastic rocks, so things that are blown out of the volcano, uh, big stones and pebbles and so on. Um, so we have, first of all, what's created underground, what is uh, um, pushed up but then solidified underground as huge, big, uh, big rocks. And these are things like granite based, often with quite high percentages of minerals like quartz in them. Um, and granites can be anything from sort of pinkish granites and grayish granites and dark granites, um, but very important. We, uh, we know granite is a very solid rock. Um, uh, I think uh, I think Arnold Schwarzenegger's jaw was mentioned as being uh, formed from granite. 
so uh, because it's so square and, and powerful, you know. Uh, so granite is uh, quite a significantly um, solid rock. Uh, basalt uh, and basalt is um, is actually a, a, a more of a felsic um, ig uh, igneous rock. It is formed with more calcium rich uh, um, uh, minerals behind it, uh, and then gabbros is. Uh, is is also quite similar it's more felsic as well so that have calcium whereas granite is much more potassium laden uh, and that's quite important when we talk about wine as well granitic based soils with potassium tends to make much smoother acidity wines because of the potassium uh, which tartrates out so it kind of gives a softness with basalt and gabbros you tend to get more kind of linear and direct acidities behind them um, they are generalizations, of course, it does depend on the composition completely. Then we have uh, extrusive, meaning, of course, being uh, pushed out of the ground. Um, and this can be actually volcanic lava, which is solidified, uh, big rocks like lapilli. Um, we have kind of rocks like these here, as you'll see. So these are actually both from Etna. You've got like a pumice stone here on this one I'm moving. And then this one here is more of a sort of a lapilli. And as these rocks are... Um, uh, pushed out of the ground and they're, th they're thrown from the volcano um, a lot of air affects it and it solidifies and that's why we've got all these holes in them as well they are very um, uh, very sort of hole laden uh, and in fact pumice stones are I think the only stone in the world that actually could float some of them in water um, so tooth is another type of uh, uh, um, sort of ash based soil as well extrusive but these are very common lapilli ash and tooth are all quite common uh, on places like uh, the Canary Islands, where you have the volcanic island of Lanzarote, has a lot of layers of lapilli uh, to it and, and tooth uh, as well. So a little bit of difference there between underground igneous rocks and then out of the ground igneous rocks. Um, now, interestingly, these rocks, because they are newly formed rocks, um, have a huge com concentration of um, minerals in them and they are very nutrient rich, they are very fertile therefore, but vines that are planted in these rocks often cannot access these because they're so locked and they're not weathered at this point. So therefore, it's interesting because we are taught as wine people, we are taught that uh, um, fertile soils make big volumes and then infertile soils make the highest quality wines. But in fact, with these igneous rocks, certainly extrusive rocks, they are quite high in fertility, so certainly around places like Etna, uh, Basilicata with Velture, and the Aeolian Islands and Stromboli and so on. Very fertile soils, but the vines actually can't access them that well. So therefore, you um, are in fertile soils, but uh, really it's quite infertile for the, uh, for the vine. Um, so uh, high in fertility, but not as we know it. Um, now, um, the styles that you tend to get from igneous rocks have been summarized quite well by John Sabo, uh, who's a master sommelier who wrote uh, a rather fantastic book called uh, The Volcanic, um, Volcanic Wines, uh, Salt, Grit and Power. Uh, and uh, there were two kind of main areas in terms of styles that will be derived from igneous based rocks, certainly more volcanic, uh, extrusive styles. Uh, and that's that you will find that the acidities can be quite uh, interesting, often quite mouth-watering. Um, they may be round and soft if they are more granitic, um, but in fact, with more um, volcano-based rocks, you'll find that they're quite uh, quite intensive. And then there's uh, this kind of savoury, herbaceous element that comes through from the wines, and it's quite a common place. Maybe you're from Somlo in Hungary, uh, maybe you are from Suave, maybe you are from Etna, um, you know, you, maybe you're from any of these volcanic zones, but you will see and feel and smell and taste this very interesting herbaceous savoury note across the, uh, across the wines. So um, igneous, wa uh, igneous wines then, or, or rather wines that are shaped from igneous solid bedrocks. So we have uh, a lot of the northern Rome being from granite, areas like Cote Roti, areas like uh, Hermitage, for instance, Saint Joseph, uh, that are nestled in the Massif Central. Um, also, places like Beaujolais uh, around the key villages of Beaujolais. So they are shaped by uh, uh, by those rocks, and uh, you'll find that the wines tend to be a little bit more complex. Um, the, so the soils are generally quite poor, 
uh, for the vine to take up uh, minerality, um, but they're good high acid levels behind them um, and density. The soils are, tend to be quite warm as well with good um, uh, uh, water, uh, warmth, uh, heat retention and conductivity. Italy, of course, uh, Sicily is famous for it, and that's uh, normally your northeast part of Sicily, uh, the north and the northeast. And of course, that's Etna, but also the Aeolian Islands. So that's Lipari, uh, Stromboli, uh, Volcano, um, and all those places, uh, quite famous. Campania with Vesuvius, Basilicata for Velture. And in the north, Suave has volcanic soils around the Classico district. And all of these wines bright acidity behind them, and then this kind of savoury element. Spain, quite famously, is the Canary Islands, um, very uh, volcanic across uh, most of the area. I think four or five active volcanoes. Um, Mount Tiede, of course, uh, on uh, Tenerife being the highest peak in Spanish land um, is very important, but also Lanzarote, which is exceedingly volcanic, uh, very dry with this lapilli and ash covering to the top of the soil. Uh, so that is famous as well. And then Greece has the island of Santorini, which is rather significant uh, for quality. The Assertico here, very high in acid again, and very herbaceous in style, and quite complex. Um, so these are just a few areas. There are many others in places like California, Oregon, Hungary, uh, Germany, um, but I've just listed some of the major ones here, um, which are well worth looking out for igneous rocks, including the top there from France, more intrusive, and then the bottom ones, much more extrusive based igneous rocks. Um, now, the second group and uh, the biggest is the sedimentary. So this is uh, sedimentary rocks formed by sedimentation by, of course, ocean, but could be lakes as well. Uh, and it could be um, could be soils. Uh, so it could be rivers um, as well. Um, now, um, because this happens over huge epochs and time lengths, we're talking millions upon millions of years where names are given to these epochs like Kimmeridian and Turonian and Oxfordian and so on. These are all the time scales and they often span millions of years, 20 to 200, 300 millions of years these epochs. Now, of course, this is a long period of time with a lot of sedimentation, and that creates this kind of onion skin layering of these different layers of sedimentation, depending on what the animal life was like in those oceans and seas during that time. And in fact, if there were oceans and seas for the, the entirety. Uh, so it is a very interesting leveling of uh, sedimentary soils. Uh, and then going from the left to the right of this one, from clay through silt and loess, which is a silty sand, and then sand and then gravel, is really about the kind of uh, the size of the soil. So clay is a very, very small size sedimentation, which clumps together and obviously has that really good water retention behind it. Silt and loess are a little bit bigger. And as you go to sand, of course, we can see sand on beaches. Uh, because we can see the little crystals, so they're a little bit larger. And then gravel, of course, is much larger than that. So, But these are all sedimented types of soils, okay? Uh, and sand is quite an interesting one, because we, we only think of sand as being a kind of a yellowish golden color, but sand has a many different colors of soil depending uh, on where it's been weathered from. So if you go to somewhere like Jamaica, Sand for them is white, pure white, uh, whereas there can be sands that are very dark and almost brownish uh, in other parts of the world. Um, and then there is the huge uh, dissolved mineral component of the soil. Uh, and I've only listed a couple here, but calcium base, so calcite and then magnesium does often uh, add a real important part for wine for us. So the higher amounts of calcium which is a real alkaline product, often around seven or eight pH, would actually mean that the wines, um, uh, the wines will tend to, as a, as a result, they have to combat against that uh, alkaline character, producing very high acids within the actual wine. So wines uh, shaped from high levels of calcium, so sedimentary based rocks with high calcium will produce very uh, linear and quite acidic wines. Think of your Chardonnays from Chablis, your, your Champagnes. Uh, and Loire Sauvignon Blancs and so on. 
uh, English sparkling wine, for, for example. Magnesium uh, you can have as well, um, very famously in the Northern Alps, uh, Northern Italian Alps rather, there's the Dolomites and there is a soil called Dolomite. Uh, I have some just uh, here, it's this one. Uh, and this is actually from um, the Alto Adige area. Uh, North Trento, Alto Adige zone. And this actually is, uh, it has calcium in it, but it's a much lower percentage than say calcium carbonate, but has a lot more magnesium in it. Uh, and this, um, we don't know exactly exactly how it massively will impact the wine, but the wines are still quite linear and acidic from that area, maybe a little bit rounder, and they combat the kind of cool climate of that zone. Um, and yeah, our types uh, then, with that dissolved amount of, uh, of um, minerality, chalk, uh, which I've got here. So chalk, uh, as you can see in this picture, chalk is a very uh, pure form of calcium, uh, often with exceedingly high amounts, you know, uh, 80, 90 uh, percent of uh, calcium within it. Uh, so these are uh, classically formed uh, around areas like southern England and across uh, parts of uh, France as well. And that chalk will make, um, being quite high in pH, will make remarkably uh, sort of acidic wines as a result. Um, quite a cold soil as well. As a bedrock, it can absorb heat quite well. Um, sorry, as a bedrock, it can absorb um, uh, water quite well, but as a topsoil, it's quite well draining. Dolomite I already picked up, uh, and that is one that's higher in magnesium. That's from northern Italy. Um, marl, uh, marl is basically half limestone, half um, clay. Uh, it's kind of uh, a clayey limestone uh, towards a mudstone sort of thing. Uh, so it's a bit of a mixture. And then shale. Shale is uh, a, another form of um, um, sort of magnesium based, uh, based rock as well. So another form of it. I'm not going to give you a list like I did on the last one of wines that are formed from sedimentary because there are so many in the world. You can have most parts of France, loads of parts of Spain, loads of parts of Italy, England, the New World, anywhere where there is water, pretty much most of the world, you'll find that potentially that area was underwater in the past, millions of years ago, and will have sedimentary soils. The last grouping of rocks is metamorphic. Uh, a metamorphic um, we put third because it can be derived from any of the previous two, so igneous and also sedimentary. So this is formed under the Earth's crust, uh, under pressure and temperature over long periods of time on existing rocks. Um, so these could be clumped together with heat and pressure, forming metamorphosizing new rocks. Um, types of these, you have things like a slate, and you have things like schist. Uh, so um, these would be actually from uh, more um, sedimentary soils like clays and shale based rocks. Uh, so they are um, sedimentary in origin, metamorphic with pressure and heat. There are many variants of these as well. Uh, we have uh, nice and nice is quite classic. Uh, it's one of those by geology students that they, they kind of are a little bit remiss to talk about because they can't pronounce it. Um, because and then when they do it's just nice um, and it is a rather nice soil so this it can be uh, it's more classic for wine as a volcanic origin certainly areas around Muscadet for instance but it can be sedimentary in origin uh, as well um, and then other things like quartzite so high um, amounts of quartz mineral in rocks um, be it um, well, normally it's sedimentary, will produce quartzite, big clumped um, together amounts of uh, rock. And I'm not sure if I've actually got any here. Uh, this is actually some quartzite, it's Galestro from, from, um, from Chianti. And you'll see that there, that whitish part is actually quartzite, which is within here. So you do find quartzite in those, uh, in those areas. So wines that are shaped by metamorphic rocks, uh, we have, uh, of course, slate-based soils in the Mosul and the Rheingau. These are tremendously loose soils as a top soil, but very good and nutrient-rich as a bottom uh, bedrock. Um, they're very well draining, um, but they're quite warm soils as well that uh, heat ret uh, retain and also conduct. So you will find that this is quite important in quite a cold place, uh, such as the Mosul and, uh, and the Rheingau quite important indeed. Um, then we have um, France, so I just mentioned in Muscadet there are some wonderful nice soils uh, and uh, this is said to produce some of the more rounded and fuller style Muscadets. Alsace has uh, metamorphic slates and schist as well in the Vosges mountain area. 
Um, Italy, I just held up the Galestro soil of Chianti Classico. Um, so that's quite common, this, uh, um, this kind of um, slaty uh, schistous rock uh, that has um, a bit of quartzite behind it. Um, so quite famous in that area. South Africa, certainly around the Paderberg uh, in the Svartland area near Ribi, Castile and Malmesbury, you'll find some uh, rather lovely um, schistous space soils, decomposing schist in that area, weathering schist. Um, so that's really it for our metamorphic. So they're the three groupings of rocks done. Now we're going to talk just a little bit about soils. And then we'll go into something uh, around uh, things like terroir, uh, for instance. So we have mentioned now minerals. We have mentioned the rocks. Now we need to mention those top soils, the, the top part of the Earth's crust, which is our soil. We had a little bit of an overview of this earlier. But it's important to talk about certain things and how they impact wine. So first of all, soils will have differing amounts of porosity. Uh, so these are the pores within the soil, so the holes, which enable oxygen and the air to, to, to go through it. And of course, this will be important for things like movement of things like water and rainfall. So this was, is where we tie into drainage. Uh, and uh, these are quite basic concepts when you talk through your WSET level two and level three. But soils often which are quite well liked are soils that need good porosity and therefore good drainage because you don't want too much water retention where the vine's root systems will be. Um, in some instances, though, you do need to understand that, in fact, water retention is needed, certainly in areas where you've got very dramatically low amounts of rain, places like Lanzarote, the island in the Canary Islands, which only has an average around one 150 millimeters of rain per year. That's exceedingly low. In Sherry, they will have around five, 600 millimeters a year, but most of it falls outside the growth season. So you need um, some quite good absorbent albariza rocks uh, as a bedrock. So you will find that you need to understand the porosity depending on the climate and the location. It is very important. Uh, so the humus, the uh, top part uh, as well, more the organic or the decaying organic matter um, is very important. The health of the soils. Uh, so this can be combated uh, if you find that you need more health by adding things like uh, fertilizer, composting or things like organic and biodynamic principles. Um, but it is said that, of course, the organic matter, certain, certain life, and maybe things like worms and that are very good at aerating the soils and producing that porosity. Uh, so it's quite important to think about uh, uh, the humus and, and the organic and also decaying organic matter. Um, we've mentioned this a couple of times as well. Different uh, soils and including rocks as well have a heat capacity of absorption, but also then conductivity to the roots. Uh, to give that warmth to that whole area in the soils. So you'll find rocks will have these, you'll have soils, the darker the soils will have more of this. And that's important in cooler areas where you need to keep the vine a little bit warmer. We've mentioned slate soils, for instance, of Germany uh, already. Um, but there are many other dark soils that are, are located around. There are brilliant soils in Hungary around Somlo, where they are all this, all, all this kind of basalty black and they are exceedingly dark but they are brilliant at heat retention, very good. And then a number of lists of nutrients, and you could probably list sort of maybe 12 to 15 different nutrients which are found for the important health of the vine and growth of grapes. Uh, and I listed some of the major ones here. So nitrogen, uh, it's not a measured amount, but nitrogen, which is found in the air, of course, the biggest uh, component of air. Um, but it's also found in soils um, uh, as well. Is It's not really that measured because we do have uh, an abundance of it. Um, we have um, things like magnesium, uh, which is important, uh, certainly in rocks like dolomite, we mentioned potassium, uh, which you'll find in things like granite, for instance, uh, and slightly darker rocks, um, quite useful. We often see that this um, this is uh, something that bitartrates out uh, the tartaric acid, softening a little bit. And that's where you see crystals uh, in wine, for instance. Calcium. So from your uh, your calcites, you've got calcium, which is, uh, uh, of course, a very high component of limestone and things like chalk, for instance. Uh, very good for more linear based fresh wines. 
Sulfur is a component found in the earth. Uh, sulfur is therefore present in the vine. It is therefore present in fermentation and therefore present in wine. All wines will contain sulfur as sulfites. Um, there are no sulfur-free wines out there. There are definitely wines that have had no sulfur added by us. Uh, and that's quite an important movement when you look at biodynamics and natural. And I'd hate to use the term natural, but I'm for ease, I'm going to use it for now. But uh, yeah, that's uh, your uh, your sulfur side of things. Um, uh, quite important as an antioxidant within winemaking and an antiseptic. Iron uh, and um, deficiencies and over uh, high amounts of iron can cause issues. Uh, but iron is definitely needed for the uh, capable plant growth. Uh, and you'll often see iron leached uh, soils, um, things like terra rossa, have very high amounts of uh, iron in them. And you'll see that with the reddish kind of soils. And you'll see them in places like Rarioca and Castilla-La Mancha, North Africa, and those kind of places. Uh, and then finally, um, really the concept of terroir. So that French word that means a lot of things. Um, remember, it's not just, just related to the soils. So it is, in fact, a misnomer when someone says, tell me the terroir, and they go, limestone. It is, in fact, an incorrect conversation all round. The terroir is a lot more than just the soils. It's inclusive, of course, of the bedrocks, the rocks, the minerals, uh, the organic matter, the local environment, the climate, and including the human influence, uh, how the vines are harvested. Um, how the vineyard is set up, but also further than that and into the next phase, is things like wild yeast, the human decision of what type of yeast to use, because you can take out a concept of terroir and reduce it by killing off wild yeast and adding in inoculated yeast. If you used wild yeasts that come from the vineyards or come from the location, that come from the winery, of course, that is a part of its terroir, part of its area. So it is very important to think about those. And sometimes they can be detrimental. Sometimes they can be very beneficial. Um, so there is a lot of studies being made around the different types of wild yeasts um, that are based around Saccharomyces, but, or the other ones like Bretonomyces, as Bretanomyces, sorry, as well. Um, and also going further, there are ter there is terroir around the origin of the clay. So the clay, if you have got cement vats, if you've got cement concrete eggs, if you've got cavevries or amphora or clay pots, um, there is all terroir around that as well. And the origin of that clay, the oak, the origin of the oak species. Have you selected it from France? Is it from Allier, Tronce? Lamosa? Is it from Hungary, Germany? Is it from the New World? Is it from America? Loads of terroir that is also involved in that aspect as well. So it's a really fascinating concept that requires a lot of discussion uh, within terroir. So please be careful when using it. Uh, and if you are corrected, if you say, what's the terroir? And you're expecting someone to say gravel, and if and they give you this huge, huge story, then it's actually because they are telling you everything about terroir. Um, but of course, we don't. We you know we don't mind it if people do say terroir, limestone, whatever. Um, it's not actually true, but it, it is often quite commonly talked about. Um, the last thing I actually haven't mentioned and I haven't put up on a slide here is just the concept of minerality as well. So this is something which is important to talk about because um, uh, from a geologist st uh, standpoint. Um, the concept of minerality in wine and that we can smell and taste it is quite interesting. It's quite interesting because it is technically not possible. Scientifically, it is not possible that we taste the minerals that we get from the earth in the wine. Yes, the vine will take up the minerals in different forms, um, but these minerals are odorless and flavorless. So the fact that we can then start to talk about minerals and it reminds us of chalkiness and mineral compounds and so on and so on is uh, actually not the most truest of concept, but I use it. Why do I use it? I use it because it's more metaphorical. It's more about what it reminds you of. It may be that you've had an experience with something that reminded you of something minerality. I've had a student say before that a wine actually smells like a, a, a Rennie um, uh, indigestion tablet. It has that kind of chalky 
dustiness to it. I've had students before, and even I've used this, that wines remind me of an oyster shell minerality. When you eat an oyster and you, um, you, you get that kind of sense of the minerality from the, the shell itself and that kind of saline note that goes with it. Um, so it's kind of linked to that. And I, I would say that minerality is also then for, therefore linked to acidity levels and the, the kind of freshness that you may get from briny characters and fresh seafood and things like that as well. Um, so it is, a, it is difficult to say that we get minerality in aromas and, and flavours, but we certainly have the metaphorical sense of them. Things like uh, you can sense flint, which is an interesting one because half of, uh, well, I'd say probably 99.9% .9 of the world has probably never smelt, smelt flint when it's sparking or a gun flint, for instance. Uh, you know, the, the French call it pierre fusil, which means gun flint. Um, I mean, I've never shot a musket, so um, but we have the sense of what it's like, that kind of smoky, um, min dusty, minerally kind of character. So it's all metaphorical, um, but uh, it certainly is something that's talked about in wine within the concept of terroir and in the flavours of wine as well. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed this section on uh, geology and wine. Um, it is by no means massively comprehensive, but it is only in uh, just over half an hour. Uh, but it gives you the outlines of geology through minerals, rocks and soils uh, and uh, how it may impact the style and then concepts of terroir. Uh, if you have any comments and questions, please get in contact at any of these social media uh, addresses. Uh, mine is at Wine with Jimmy personally. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, we hope to see some of you on our online tastings and courses soon or at our wine schools in Fulham and in South London or at our wonderful wine bar, which has a stonking 350 wines on the list, including many terroir driven styles. So thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure and see you again soon. Bye bye.